Something You Ought to Know by Lemony Snicket The right hand doesn't know what the left is doing is a phrase that refers to times when people ought to know, but don't know about something that is happening very close to them. For instance, you ought to know about the man who watches you when you sleep. He is a quiet man, which is why you don't know about him. You don't know how he gets into your home, or how he finds his way into the room in which you sleep. You don't know how he can stare at you for so long without blinking. And you don't know how he manages to be gone by morning, without a trace. And you don't know where he purchased that long, sharp knife, curved like a crescent moon, that he holds in his left hand, sometimes just millimeters from your eyes, which are closed and flickering in dreams. There are, of course, things he does not know about you, either. He does not know what you're dreaming about, but then it may be that he doesn't care. His clothes are rumpled and have odd rips in them here and there. One of his coat sleeves is longer than the other, and this may be to cover his right hand. The sleeve is long enough that if you were to wake up and see him, which you never do, you might not see that his right hand is strange and crooked. It would take a while in the darkness of the room to notice that it has three missing fingers. He comes every night. His right hand does not know what the left is doing. In Hiding by Kenneth Opple My father and I lay tensely side by side in total darkness, not daring to breathe. The space was small and smelled bad. We were flat on our backs, scarcely able to lift our heads. Above us, the thing shifted restlessly on its bed, grunting. I hoped it would settle itself soon. Finally, the thing stopped moving. I counted the seconds. Was it asleep, or just lying there awake, waiting? No, my father whispered in my ear. And very slowly, we reached out and up to grasp the child's ankles in our cold, dead hands. Nanny by Angela Johnson My nanny Sarah tucks me in as the shadows wait for her to leave so they can creep out of my closet towards me. She smiles as she steps over the books and puzzle pieces I've left on the floor, then closes my door. But tonight I decide to escape the shadows. I open the door and dash toward Sarah's room, only to find her at the end of the hall, whispering to them, the shadows, and telling them with a smile that I was waiting for their nightly visit to my room. A Walk Too Far by Gloria Whelan I had walked too far, ending up in a neighborhood of homes with a deserted look. The streetlights came on and I hurried from one pale pool of light to the next, searching for something familiar. At last admitting I was lost, I approached a house where the flick of a curtain suggested it was occupied. Hoping for directions, I knocked on the door. The man who answered my knock appeared strangely pleased to see me, as though he'd been waiting for me, or someone like me, to appear. He ushered me into a darkened room. So, then no one knows you're here. I heard a key turn in the lock. A Very Short Story by Holly Black Zoe sits on her bed with her mother at the foot. The overhead light is on, flooding most of the room, although shadows still creep up the walls at the edges. Sit with me until I fall asleep, Zoe says. There's a party going on downstairs. Zoe's mother hesitates. She can hear the clink of glasses, the bursts of low laughter. She's restless, wanting to be down there, but Zoe will just sit alone in her brightly lit bed and wait for her mother to come back and finish the ritual. Zoe won't sleep otherwise. Okay, Zoe's mother says. Get under the covers. Zoe snuggles down under them. Tell me why vampires can't get me. Vampires can't come unless they're invited, Zoe's mother says, as she always does. What about werewolves? Zoe's mother makes a show of looking through the curtains. No full moon tonight. Zoe's eyes drift closed, but she's far from sleeping. She has a new question, one she's just thought up. What about ghosts? Her mother pauses, looking down at her hands. Finally, she answers. Ghosts don't want to hurt anyone. If they hurt you, they do it by accident. What if they hurt me by accident, then? Zoe says, looking up at her mother. They can only hurt the living, Zoe's mother says, her voice soft. Oh, 
says Zoe. After a few moments, Zoe is asleep. Her mother leans in to kiss her goodnight, but it's like kissing smoke. Deep Six by Faye Kellerman When I started to say something witty, Babe interrupted. We're not interested, Tubby. The only reason we're here is because you have a pole. She swung her magnificent waist-length blonde hair in my face. You should wear a bathing cap, you know. She laughed. Yeah, I could also be a dork like you, Tubbs. My name's Tabitha, I said under my breath. I ran a hand through the warm eddies of the jacuzzi. I wasn't fat. I was Rubenesque. It's just that morons like Babe were anorexic. I hated her. She tortured me whenever she had an audience. Which was all the time. The only reason I put up with her is because everywhere she went, she brought all the good-looking boys. Jacuzzi, anyone? Babe asked as she stepped into the whirling water. Get out of the way, Tubbs! We need the space! No problem. My hand went to the safety cap of the intake valve, and I slowly loosened it until it dropped to the floor. It only took a few seconds for Babe's hair to catch, her pouty lips forming an O, her eyes wide open as she was sucked underwater. Everyone started to scream, but I was somewhere else. Serves her right. She should have worn a bathing cap. The Creeping Hand by Margaret Atwood the hand crept up the cellar stairs. It was shriveled and dirty, and its fingernails were long. It scuttled along the dark hallway. At the closed door, it sniffed with its fingertips, then jumped up like a giant spider, grabbed the doorknob, and turned. Inside the room, it found a sock, then a shoe, and then another hand hanging down from the bed. A young hand, a hand that it could kidnap and take away down to the cellar. But this hand was attached to an arm. Something could be done about that. Wet Sand, Little Teeth by Mariko Tamaki The hole was about four feet deep and three feet wide, and mostly, you know, it was just a hole this girl Jenny from Three Cottages Over found. Jenny said she saw someone digging the hole, although she didn't know why someone would, like, create this big hole and then just leave it there. I'd never seen anyone walking around with a shovel, but Jenny said she saw a guy. In some ways, the hole appeared almost as mysteriously as Jenny, who just sort of showed up on our porch one day, looking for snacks and someone to play with. Wow, that kid sure is little for someone who eats so much, my dad used to say. She looks like a lemur. Mom said to ignore dad. It's good she finally gets someone her age up here after all her wishing. It may seem strange, but playing in the hole with Jenny was really fun. Jenny had a million games that involved a hole in the sand. The hole itself was kind of cool. Every day, Jenny and I found some new weird thing pushed into the sand at the bottom. One time, it was this pile of teeth Jenny said were small white stones, but they were pointy. Once, it was a chewed up flip-flop. We would play there together all day until about the time it started to get dark. As soon as there was a hint of not sunshine anymore, Jenny would always find some reason to get out of the hole, typically by demanding that it was time to go get a popsicle at my place. You can't stay here. I mean, we can't stay here. She would always insist. Get out of the hole. Jenny was kind of bossy. I don't exactly remember all the things that happened on that day in August. At some point, Jenny and I were fighting about something, by which I mean that Jenny probably wanted something that I would not give to her. That evening when the sun started to set, Jenny jumped out of the hole and said I should stay. Stay, she whispered as she crawled out. Go ahead. At first, nothing happened. Then the dark started spreading over the sand and sank into the hole. That's when I felt it. Something touching me. Like a finger. At first I thought it was a sand toad. Uh, Jenny? Then there was a sound. Like a swallow in reverse. Gravelly. Then it grabbed me. Grabbed my feet. Something with strong, scratchy hands. I kicked one foot free. Tried to reach out to Jenny, but she was walking away. I watched her disappear, watched her feet as I grabbed for the edge of the hole, which I couldn't really grab because it was sand. Then the something grabbed my shoulder, and I took a deep breath and it felt like a hammer in my throat, and I blacked out. When I woke up, my mom was wrapping me in a beach towel, and my dad was holding a flashlight looking at me. What's that on her shoulder? Mom screamed. A mark, like little white teeth. 
We still don't know what it is. Now I'm not allowed to play with Jenny. Or the hole. Dad filled it up. Just as well, I guess. Jenny's a jerk. Unannounced by Eliza Kellerman Hi, Alan said, his eyes huge and pleading. He was rain-drenched, slicked wet in a t-shirt and cargo pants. Eight weeks after dumping me, and you show up now. Real nice. He wiped his face. You've been counting? Leave. Just leave. She wanted to close the door, slam it in his face, but he looked like he needed to say something. What? He took one step inside, then back out. I love you. She blinked. Great for you. This time she had no problem shutting him out, for good. At breakfast the next morning, her brother gently tapped her shoulder. Emmy? She rubbed her eyes groggily. She'd barely slept the night before, thinking of that pleading look he'd given her, and the rain coating his hair. Remember that kid you used to see? Alan What's-His-Face? She opened her mouth, then closed it. Why? They found his body at the bottom of St. Peter Lake. It was on the front page. What? She stuttered. What happened? He shrugged. I don't know, Em. Paper says he'd been there about two months. But... that... that's impossible. I'm sorry, Em. This must be so weird for you. You hadn't heard from him in months, and now you'll... He trailed off. I'll never see him again. She finished, and she wondered if it was true. At the Water's Edge by Aelit Waldman The water is still, and so clear I can see the tangled stems of the lily pads leading down to the muddy bottom. I have made a careful study of the lilies, their white outer leaves that shade to pale pink and finally to magenta. The pistols are bright orange, the color of the dress my mother was wearing when she left for work this morning, only a few minutes before the children came. I am paying close attention to the blossoms floating in the pond, because I do not want to look at the children. The pond is small, and they have surrounded it entirely. They stand very still, staring at me. I think they don't even blink, but since I try to avoid their eyes, I can't really tell. They don't say a word. It has been three hours since they first burst through the doors and crawled through the windows, silent all the while. Even when they snatched my little sister from her crib and bundled her away, my mother should be home by now. They have never once spoken, or shouted, even when I managed to tear loose from their filthy hands and race out to the pond. They chased me, their fingers brushing the edges of my clothes. I leaped into the canoe and paddled out to the middle of the pond. A smart thing to do, it turns out, since it seems they cannot swim. But the pond is shallow, and soon enough they'll figure out that they can wade. Already I see one or two of them testing the water with their dirt-encrusted toes. I hear the noise of an engine, and only now do I allow myself to burst into tears. My mother is home. Her car is coming up the driveway. She'll chase them away. Except the car door is opening, and it is not my mother who is getting out. It is one of the children, dirty and disheveled with torn clothes and bare feet. I'm staring at the child who has replaced my mother, and there is no air left in my lungs. The child lifts her hand and waves. It will be dark soon. There's Something Under the Bed by Alan Stratton There's something under the bed! Don't be silly. You're a big boy now, his father said and turned out the light. But there is! Please, Daddy, look! So his father got down in the dark beside the bed and disappeared. Daddy? Where are you, Daddy? A gentle chuckle. <laughs> I'm under the bed. You sound different. Do I? Yes, very different. Are you really daddy? Why don't you come under the bed and find out? Cat's Paw by Sarah L. Thompson. The boy sat up in bed, listening. First a feathery sound, like a dry paintbrush whispering across paper then footsteps softer than his own heartbeat. Finally a thump more felt than heard, as something landed on the bed. The boy groped for his lamp, he touched the switch, he looked at the cat sitting by his feet, 
Oh, it's you, he sighed. I thought it was something scary. Silly, said the cat. Cats aren't scary. I'm dreaming, the boy whispered. Cats can't talk. I wouldn't worry about that, answered the cat. Her whiskers were wet with something sticky and dark. I'd worry about the rats, she added. Now that's scary. Inside the wall, the boy could hear tiny claws scrabbling at plaster. When the claws broke through, he could swear the cat smiled. In Conclusion by Gregory Maguire You turn the page in the anthology of nightmares. Your heart throbs. At least this is the last story. But you begin to anticipate the way one does. The two infamous words centered in bold-faced type farther on. Don't look. Don't dare glance ahead. You will come to them in time. We all do. They wait for us. The Omega Prophecy curses the turn of the page. Inevitable. Final. What if, when you get there, you find out the truth of this bedeviled book? That those words mean what they say? That they really are? The end.